Okay. Uh, hello, Paul Dyer, and um, welcome to the Future of Foods uh, interviews. Uh, you are a professor of fungal biology at the University of Nottingham, and you are also chief scientific officer um, at Myconios, which is also based in Nottingham. And um, from what I understand, you're working on um, new fungal strains for food applications. Can you just uh, introduce yourself quickly and, um, you know, above what I've just done and kind of tell us a little bit about um, mm -hmm. your work? Yeah, yes. Thank you, Alex, for that introduction. Yes. So um, I am a fungal lover. I've been working on fungi for, um, I hate to say it, 30 years now. So I started on my PhD and then did postdoctoral research on fungi, both the good and bad fungi. And um, for the last 10 to 15 years, we've been working particularly on fungi use for food production and trying to see if we can produce better strains, so better nutrition, better performing ones. And uh, part of that work has involved looking at the sex life of fungi, believe it or not, uh, because if you've got a sexual uh, reproducing fungus, you can use things like uh, breeding to get better strains. And one of uh, my big discoveries, which perhaps we can go into in a bit more detail as we go on, is that we managed to find a way of getting some sexually recalcitrant species that weren't very happy to do sex uh, to undergo sexual reproduction. And we've applied that to a few different fungi. And most recently, and quite exciting, we've been looking at uh, food fungi used in food production, particularly ones used for mould ripened cheeses, such as blue cheeses. And that's what led to my involvement with this uh, new university spin out company called Mike and Eos, because we made a discovery to make new strains of the blue cheese fungus. And this company, Mike and Eos, was set up to start with uh, to look at new strains of blue cheeses. But we've since broadened out a bit to look at other applications as well. I see. So um, so you were already working on new strains uh of blue cheese. So what is specific? What is particular about the strains used in blue cheese then? Uh, so there's a, in the blue cheese, it's a species called Penicillium roqueforti. And as you might guess from the species name roqueforti, it's, it was first isolated from roquefort cheese. And it's an interesting one because it's present naturally in the environment. Uh, you can isolate it from things like silage, from straw, but it seems over the process of uh, traditionally hundreds of years, uh, it looks like certain strains have been isolated from nature, which when you put them into milk and you, you know, the curds that you get to develop cheese, it's particularly got very lively enzyme action. So it produces lipase and protease enzymes that break down the curd. And when it does that, it produces all these really interesting volatile compounds. So that's where you get depending if you're a blue cheese lover or not, you get that lovely blue cheese aroma. And in terms of taste, it's said to be one of the most complex food substrates there is. There's, there's estimated to be at least 120, if not more, different volatiles being produced in the blue cheese. So you get, first of all, you get that lovely blue cheese rich flavour. But as well as that, you then get the the uh, enzymes breaking down the cheese. So that's why you get, depending which type of blue cheese, you can either get quite a creamy one like Gorgonzola, or you get quite a crumbly one, you know, with this traditional Stilton. So it's it's the fungal strains, it's the enzymes that are being produced by the fungal strains breaking down the cheese that causes the texture of the cheese then? That That's right. So you start off with, in the case of Stilton, for example, you start yeah. off with a fairly solid cheese. It's not as hard. It's not compacted, unlike, say, cheddar, which they actually put under pressure. So Stilton is produced by getting the curd, putting it into so-called hoops, which are like big wheels. And then you let the water gradually drain away. So you get a, a fairly firm cheese, but not a solid cheese. Mm. But then. In the case of Stilton, they they then you have the fungus in the cheese already, but you use 
wires to pierce the cheese and that produces little oxygen columns yeah and you notice if you look at your blue cheese you've got like veins going through it mm -hmm. and that's where the cheese has been pierced allowing the fungus to grow and then when the fungus is growing it produces its enzymes which as i say then both break down the cheese and but also simultaneously unusually produce this rich variety of volatile compounds because obviously other fungi will break down cheese but you wouldn't get the rich flavors coming through interesting uh and what is also interesting is that my first job when i was well after being a paper boy my first job uh was working in the stilton cheese factory putting those copper spikes into the stilton oh. cheese. <laughs> uh, great coincidence <laughs> yes it is it is quite yeah um so it's the the smell of stilton cheese is the is the enzymes breaking down the cheese is that that's the smell is it yes so the uh particularly the lipase enzyme which break down the fats they mm. particularly produce a range of volatiles there's a particular group known as methyl ketones uh which are volatile methyl compounds which explains the pungent smell yeah. you also get things like some alcohols produced and some so there's a range of different it's quite an it is a very unusual fungus in that it does produce this range of volatiles <laughs> quite why we don't know you could speculate in the natural environment perhaps they're produced you know in a competitive way to stop other things growing but you know we're not exactly sure right so you said that the penicillium rock for grows naturally so uh so you know how is it used in other ways rather than in cheese um so as i say it's in the natural environment it will break down straw and organic matter as many okay. fungi do um and so in the natural environment it's got quite quite an important role in terms of breaking things down you know that's one of mm. the jobs fungi do in the environment they're really useful to recycle nutrients in terms of applications penicillium rock for rock forti is primarily used for cheese production that's where it's been used for hundreds if not thousands of years and just a little side story i just read a new article that came out last month where they've been looking at uh some human sites going back they thought they think about six to eight thousand years and they looked at the fecal matter oh, of wow. these human sites and found penicillium rock forti in them and they were speculating that even several thousand years ago people were ingesting things made with which is quite fascinating okay. um but in terms of other applications um there were what there have been suggestions you can use the species for things like um, clean up of environmental uh, toxins. And there was one paper came out a few. Um, I think some people have even used it. There's a new uh, craze on fungal fashions where you can grow, you produce uh, clothes with fungi growing in them. And I, I have seen one designer using it, you know, in a sort of little layer system transparent layer great so if you could have a lovely dress covered in fungal molds depending okay. on your particular flavor but... <laughs> so i mean and it's got um you know in the in the name it sort of says penicillium does that mean that that it's it also works as a as an antibiotic uh good good question because that sometimes does scare people and they don't want to try you know, because you do get some people allergic to penicillin. Right. And um, the the name penicillium refers to a whole group. It's about um, I think it's over 300 species of penicillin species, which all grow in a similar fashion. That's how we define them as penicillium. Okay. And within that group, you do indeed get some species such as uh, penicillium chrysogenum, which was from which Fleming discovered uh, penicillin. However, it is a very diverse group. So um, it's I think there's been some genome studies said showing that it's they're as diverse as we are to say um, fish. 
you know, so they are a very wide group. So mm. although some of them do indeed produce valuable antibiotics, in the case of Penicillium rock forti, it doesn't produce penicillin. Okay. It does have this other, it does produce some other interesting compounds, um, which the other penicillin producers don't do. Like what? Um, so we've got, there's one called mycophenolic acid, for instance. And interestingly, that one has been shown that you can use it. It may have uses in suppressing uh, blood pressure. Okay. There And <laughs> interesting speculation that it, there is a health uh, to, um, phenomenon known as the French paradox, which is the fact that the French diet has lots of fat, lots of cheese, and yet levels of cardiovascular disease are lower in France than many comparable countries. And people have wondered why that's the case. And there is some speculation it might be partly due to eating blue cheese because it, it produces the mycophenolic acid, which is known to suppress um, to so it reduces pressure. your cholesterol then by uh, it's blood pressure rather than cholesterol and we okay. don't know exactly we don't know exactly how it works but there is a link right there's also some speculation there's a compound called resveratrol in red wine as well that might contribute but the french have got it right you know cheese and wine have a lovely yeah yeah <laughs> I mean, it's it's probably also because of the sunshine, but then of course it's not. It, you know, there's not sunshine all over France, is there? It's only in the south. But uh, but um, I mean, blue cheese is also quite popular in the UK, isn't it? But I suppose not as popular as France. Perhaps not as broadly popular. I'm not sure. No, I I think one difference between the countries seems to be. Um, the UK, we've got a very seasonal consumption of cheese. So we, we are beginning, the run, depending when this goes out, the run up to Christmas as we're talking. And yeah. traditionally in the UK, you know, built stilton something you would have at Christmas. That's you know, right. the big, mm -hmm. um, and then the rest mm -hmm. of the year it goes a bit quiet. The market does, you know, significantly drop. So it hit, in the UK, it's very seasonal, whereas I think France, Italy yeah. with soda as well they would be eating it much more all year round i see yeah. i see so um you at at uh at at myconius you are making different strains of cheese using slightly different strains of penicillium rock forte so how are you how are you finding the different strains what's the you know what's the process what what happened right, yeah so th this this was I suppose, really the big breakthrough we were involved with in that historically the fungus was only known to reproduce as an asexual organism. So it only produced clones of itself. So when it's right. reproducing, you've got genetically identical offspring. Okay. Um, or, and so in terms of thinking about the different types of blue cheese, we, we've done some genetic analysis on populations of the fungus and found that you do get distinct rock for Stilton and uh, Gorgonzola strains. So they are genetically isolated. And when you, you're growing them, propagating them, they just re basically, you just get identical copies of them when you're subculturing them. Okay. And that was the only way the species was known to reproduce. Uh, but the breakthrough we were involved in at Nottingham was that we were for the first time able to induce a sexual cycle in the fungus. So wow. we were able to get two different strains together, cross them in the lab. And uh, in the same way, you know, sex in plant, animal, microbes, whatever you're looking at, when you cross them together, you then get tremendous variation. So you think if you've got kids... Mm. You think about how your kids are different from your parents. Yeah. And That's the big that... difference, so I was going to say, and the big difference with the fungal one is whereas you might only have two kids, they they have a, tens of thousands all from one sexual. So, you know, it's huge variation you're generating. Okay. So what does that, what does that mean? 
you know, I, I, I understand, I understand the, uh, I understand the sort of logistics of it, uh, but uh, what does it mean in the bigger picture to you know you and me and 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 the world? You, you know, it sounds like um, it sounds like something from a sci-fi film that they could <laughs> kind of reproduce to such an extent that they, you know, that they take over the planet. Uh, if you've watched the um, the TV series The Last of Us, it is actually in, in the. Re- in the same group of they're called ascomycete fungi but uh fortunately they're they're not quite as bad i hasten to say <laughs> but in in terms of what uh mike and Neos is involved with what it means is we can for, in, for example uh take a french rock for strain mm-hmm. we've then been able to take a british stilton strain and we've introduced them together Given them the right mood lighting, the right <laughs> background <laughs> music, music, etc., and we've then managed to get that cross. And then what we've done is we've isolated from that. Although that in theory you could you could keep selecting thousands, we, for example, collected a hundred offspring from that cross. And what we've then done is we've then got a um model system where we can grow up grow them up in little mini cheeses for flavor Mm. and we can then screen all of these mini cheeses for flavor and then pick up interesting new ones and what and we've done some uh taste trials you know public people with and fascinatingly what we've found is that when you you can also use a technique called gas chromatography to look at the volatiles they produce so if you like, you're not just relying on your subjective human taste. You, you've got an objective way that when you look at the flavor volatiles they produce, some of them are similar to the two parents, as you'd expect. But fascinatingly, you get some that are hybrids, right. so like a mix of a Stilton and Rock 4. And then you also get the odd few that are completely off the wall. You know, they're completely in a new flavor space as we call it it's and again you think of sex in human you know you think about yeah families etc you get ones that are quite outliers from the parents i see so uh, what what would you do with those what would you do with those then what would be you, so, so what, a good use of them so what we've done um is we've then got these different flavor and we we've made together at the university and together with Mike and us, we've made cheeses with them um predicted the flavors and then we've selected maybe 30 we think are really interesting and we've then gone out made some cheese with uh, a couple of friendly artisan cheese makers that we've got the biggest blue cheese maker in Scotland uh together with a uh, local uh guy from Shropshire helped us make lots of cheese and Mm. we've literally produced several hundred kilos of cheese which has been quite fun and then Mm. we've gone out and basically we've done taste trials both with professional taste trialers but also the public and we've then chose and we finally called what we called the x-factor cheese tasting where we selected what we thought were our best ones and made cheese either with those or with current rock for stilton strains and when we did it we did the blind trials and we were delighted to say that the top four rated ones were our new cheeses mm. and what we've got in it's interesting what what we had in there were for instance a much a milder strain so it still had the rich blue cheese taste mm. but it, it had lost the sort of bitterness and really strong ammonia, which I think a lot of people don't like. Mm. But yet it still had that rich blue cheese flavour. Um, particularly for maybe younger, we did it with a lot of PhD students at the university, the youngest people and the more female audience, they did like the mild. And these were people that wouldn't normally eat blue cheese. Okay. So we were, in terms of, what we're giving back we're giving people that lovely blue cheese sensory experience and maybe mycophenolic acid to help their blood pressure (laughs) but also intriguingly we uh, managed to find one strain from the sexual crosses that we nicknamed intense and it's the strongest blue cheese you've ever tasted (laughs) it's incredibly strong you know it's it's so it's very rich 
uh, very umami, very blue. And I think for people that <laughs> didn't like blue cheese, you know, I think they they, they were like horrified it. by it. You know, it was just too much. But for the people that like blue cheese, we have people begging to take it away, saying, wow, I've never tr tried anything like that. This is very interesting, isn't it? So, so you, I mean, it's uh, it's kind of a um, uh, it's kind of a rare thing, I suppose, to to invent a brand new blue cheese. You know, it's you know we've had we've had the same ones now for hundreds of years, right? So you 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 know there'll be new ones on the market as a result of this. Is that is that yes? Yeah, so, so exactly, and you know, speaking as a <laughs> biologist it's really really exciting to see actually something coming out of it I was uh because you're quite we've basically had the Gorgonzola Stilton Rock for as the three cheeses and as I say we've done some genetic analysis to show why they're different yeah. but for the first time ever <laughs> we've been able to cross and I should say we discovered this at Nottingham there was also a French group also looking at it around the same time who reported it slightly after us so i think the french if there's french people looking also at this mm. primarily from a rock for perspective so okay. it is it is the first time that a sexual stage has been described in the so it's, if you think back to things like traditional plant breeding producing new species of wheat for instance and how we had the green revolution yeah in wheat, that was all possible through breed and so for the first time we've got the tools to allow us to do it with blue cheese yeah so are you going to bring these new cheeses to market is so what i i'm primarily you know university academic so but yeah. my career so i'm fortunate to have some good colleagues with experience from the food industry that i'm working with and the model we've we've decided on is that we will produce the new strains but we're not actually cheese makers ourselves. You know, that leaves a lot of experience. So what, the way uh, the company is now set up is that we are selling the strains to cheese makers. And we're currently, um, as of this year, you know, we've we've for the first time been able to produce these at commercial level yeah. together with an Italian uh, producer who's helping us make them. Um, so we, we're now be going out to various cheese producers and we've got, I think it was about 20 people trialing them in the UK at the moment. Um, yes. To watch this I was, space. <laughs> I was told by one of your colleagues that um that actually in making it blue is is uh is a choice and it could it could just as easily be yellow or red or orange. So <laughs> And he was saying that actually it's it's um it's 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 made blue in order to appeal to to you know people's sort of sense of you know of of what they kind of deem acceptable mm. not kind of thinking if it had red veins in it it might put people off trying it. Yeah, that's another great question. So that, this is more recent research. Uh, so having used the sexual breeding to produce new flavors, we then began to think, well, what what else can we do, you know, to give people a novel experience in mould ripened cheese? And uh, what we then did was a study of what made it blue. And what we were able to do through our research was we discovered that there was a pigment part biosynthesis pathway where you, whereby you start with a white pigment that's gradually then converted to the dark blue green, which is the color of the fungus that you see in the cheese but uh what we found there's about five different steps and what happens is if you block them at any of those steps you get intermediate colors so it goes basically from white to a sort of yellow light yellow to a what we call christmas tree green is the next okay. one yeah. it then goes through uh, a sort of two brownie red colors before going to a light blue and then finally a deep blue green. So you've got all those different steps. And we've been able to, using classical techniques, we've been able to block it, certain strains. And just this year, we, so what we've been able to do is not produce just blue green strains, but we've got how the light blue sky blue strains. We've got my fav personal favorite is the Christmas tree green, 
It's okay. literally like the bride creed. And okay. uh, together yeah. with our friendly uh, artisan cheesemakers, we've mo most recently we've been trialing them in cheese. And it is fascinating. You then see the vein and rather than blue, you know, the dark blue. And I think a lot of people don't like blue cheese because it looks like molds growing in it. But it's mm -hmm. funny, you can get the light sky blue and it looks beautifully attractive. Well, and people will eat them. So <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's that's interesting, isn't it? I mean, if you're introducing a new cheese to the market, I think people often just think all blue cheese is the same. Um so perhaps if you introduced it with a slightly different, um, you know, pigment, then mm. it's, it's, it, it could it could appeal to a whole new range of people, you know, like a new color for the new century or something. That That's right. And um, there is, it, although it's not my specialty, there's a whole load of food psychology out there to do with color and perception. Yeah. And we in one of our tests, for example, we knew from our blind tasting of the gcms that the, the light blue and the dark blue had the same flavor yes yet when people ate them the light blue they rated as mild and the dark blue is in interesting <laughs> which is it and yeah as i say i as a biologist it's very i very rewarding for me because people then like the light blue who wouldn't eat blue so i you know it's a pleasure to see them enjoying a fungal product because yes. I'm, I'm a fungal lover, you know, I want to. <laughs> I'm a fungal lover as well, um, which is why I, I do these podcasts. It's, but I'm, I, I also, um, I want to, has there been any, uh, have you, uh, clearly you need to sort of patent your production methods and and your, and your mm. new cheeses. Is, is that something, if you have, if you have a thousand strains that come out of um, you know out of your kind of sexual reproduction. Mm. Do you have to sort of trademark and patent each one of those? That yes. So as as the patent law stands, uh, in terms of microbiology, you can patent strains, mm. but it's difficult to patent the, the sexual process because that is previously published scientific uh, public work. So mm -hmm. we. Um, Patterns. So, for example, from our hundred, well, several hundred starting strains, we've managed to narrow it down to four strains, the mild, the intense one I was mentioning. We've also got what we call the classic and the artisan strains. Okay. Um, we, we've patented the use of those strains for dairy and food applications. So are these the only four that you've sent out to people then? Uh, those were our top four, yeah. and those are the ones that Mike and Neos is initially selling. But I think the pl the plan is we're then going to go on to produce some more strains, do what we call some second generation. So taking these and then sexually crossing them. Yeah. So if you like thinking about something like wheat, you know, that's gone through centuries of selective breeding. We've yeah. only just started. So we've you know we've got <laughs> plenty to keep us busy to i mean you know there's there's such a, a an an immensely interesting uh, uh potential around um uh you know um you know mixing mixing the strains together what's the kind of you know what's the scientific term for that um mixing together what is re it re recombination recombination <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah <laughs> So what you know, because you know, there was sort of mushrooms and fungi out there that have incredible uh kind of properties, right? That kind of produce mm. enzymes that, that are that are you know, you know, kind of anti-cancerous, you, you know, sort of cast, you know, and anti-carcinogenic, is that the right term? Yes, yeah. yeah. And and uh ones that, that, that can break down toxins like you've already mentioned and, mm. and um you know, clear up oil spills and 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 uh and and break down plastics and things like mm. that so um if you were if you were able to sort of take these fungi and um uh and recombine them um i mean perhaps you know the you know, you know the the sort of possibilities are endless i'd imagine it, it is really exciting i mean 
there are some restrictions so different species are particularly good at certain things though for instance the ones that break down some of the environmental products are say like a diff likely to be different from the ones we use for food production yes but no matter which species you can do if you can find a sexual cycle in them you can then use that for strain improvement so one classic bit of work i was involved with uh, 10 years ago now was looking at the penicillin producing species for example and we were able to again together with the german group um were able to sex get sex in that for the first time and by doing that we were able to develop strains that didn't produce an unwanted side product but had boosted levels of penicillin production okay so we um and a topical one that um we're particularly interested in at the moment is the production of alternative proteins mm. so uh so fungi are a wonderful sort potential source of alternative proteins you know given uh, uh problems with meat production yes um, and so there are things like the corn fungus that's a wonderful one and also uh for instance the fungus rhizopus that's used for tempeh production so what we're hoping to do is to try and apply some of these techniques to see if we can use these fungi as improved sources of alternative proteins that would be really exciting to do interesting i've i've just i've just launched i've just launched a podcast today which was um uh which was with the ceo and founder of a company called libra foods do you okay do you know them um it to be honest it rings a bell but okay honest, well they're based yeah, well, they're based in Barcelona, and they they make some meat alternatives. Oh yes, yes, no, yes, yes. So they have a bacon product that's out at the yeah. moment, and it's sort of a B two B company, and they're launching mm. a chicken product. So, so yes, there's a lot of it, and also in regards to sort of cultivated meat, as uh, you know, using it as a hybrid, because you know the kind of cultivated meat itself is 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 very expensive to produce. Mm. So. Um, you know, kind of fusing the two together is clearly going to be big business going forward. Mm. I mean, it, it's uh, just, again, being taught at Nottingham, there's a company called Adamo Foods that one of my former PhD students, Paul Brett, is now working for. And they are, again, trying to produce fungal meat alternatives. Okay. Um, if you go on to that, they've got some delicious looking pictures, you uh, and again, but it's very early days. So we've got all of this. You think about animal and plants. Yeah. Centuries of strain. Improve. We're really at that starting place with many of these fungi. So it's really. So. so what's the, um you know, what's the basics for that then Adamo foods? Are they just, you know, you know, it has these sort of umami flavors in the mushroom. It has the sort of texture mm. and, and, and the rest of it. Is there a way of making it? kind of tastes more meaty or is it I so guess i think that that's oils, isn't it? yeah so i think in the case of adamo that's part of their trade secret of course okay, okay. Uh, but they're they're aiming to make steaks you know meat cuts i think is their particular and so they're developing ways of growing fungi that produce the texture of meat okay so it's um, in the breeding is it it's in the um it's in the it's a mix. So I think they've started with strains that are currently available. Mm -hmm. But where, you know, the the work we're involved with, Mike and Nielsen at the university, maybe, we might then be able to take strains such as that and sexually breed them to get ones that are even better, you know, and they might have higher enzyme activity. Yeah. Different, slightly better improved texture. Again, that's the wonderful thing about sexual reproduction. You just get this tremendous variation mm. and you can pick, pick the good ones. I suppose I suppose some of the really interesting things comes from some mutations in the breeding, doesn't it? Mm. So it's kind of things that you sort of don't expect that that is that, you know, that can do things that you, you know, that you never even imagined possible. Yeah. And. <laughs> It's interesting because at the moment there's a lot of emphasis on the use of GM, you know, to get better strains. 
And GM is in many respects a wonderful technique because you can knock out individual genes, yeah. see the effect of them, or you can insert individual genes that say help vitamin production. Yeah, It's uh, in many ways a wonderful technique, but it is qu also quite narrow in that you're only affecting one gene that you're putting in and out. And it might be that somewhere else in the genome, there's some really important ones that you simply don't know about. Right. And that's where sexual reproduction is valuable, because basically you're scrambling the whole, all your genes together and yeah. in a food safe, natural way to produce this unexpected and I, variation. I was mentioning earlier that we have this intense strain of penicillin. Yes. Yeah. And it really is. It's a shame we can't. It sounds have, like that's uh, your favorite one. I do like it very much. Yeah, I'm, I'm quite well. I'm a blue cheese lover, though. So, <laughs> no, I did take. Um, I was, I was given a sample when I was in your, um, when I was in your offices. Oh, and, okay, uh, yes. Uh, and I'm not sure which one it is, but uh, you know, she did say that this one is quite an intense one. So I'm, I'm not sure whether she gave me that one. I'm not sure. I'll have to have a look at the name and and let you know. Uh, but it's very nice. I've enjoyed it. You know, it didn't taste more intense than a stilton or a rock for so mm. it's not that one maybe it's um one of the other strains not sure to be honest i think the samples that we have at the labs they're all frozen though so they may be not they were frozen the best, you know so yeah. yes so it may be you didn't get the full benefit let's say <laughs> i see okay all right well um i also so uh, i just wanted to ask you so you know yeah, this method um, uh, of recombining them, is this also going to help produce new antibiotics? It, in theory, it could do, yes. And um, again, this is future work we'd have to do to screening. But uh, for example, on penicillium rock forti, we have characterized some, some of the compounds, such as the mycophenolic acid I mentioned earlier, coming out mm. of it. And penicillium rock forti is known to produce about 10 what, what are known as secondary metabolites, which are things that many of them, that includes things like penicillin that have antibiotic activity. Mm -hmm. uh, we did this in connection with a group in Denmark, someone called Jens Frisvat. And he was intrigued because one of our sexual progeny had a compound he'd never seen before. Right. OK. And he said, this is amazing. I've never seen it in this um, speed. And it so somehow the sex is like you might take two dark haired people and suddenly you get a ginger haired person coming out as one of the projects. <laughs> how, right. how did that happen? You know, <laughs> but in the G, you know, you you know, if you, if certain things come together in a, you know, favorable fashion, you do occasionally get these odd recombination events that maybe lines up all the genes you need. Yeah. So, yes, the answer is um, already we've got some evidence they can produce novel compounds not seen before. Okay. Um, and <laughs> you've just given us a good idea to go and test it for antibiotic. <laughs> I mean, we, we hadn't thought along those lines. Maybe you can patent that, you see. So, Well, yeah, maybe. Maybe that's the <laughs> perhaps that's the moneymaker right there. So, Paul, how did you get interested in um, in this area then, in, you know, in, in fungi? Um, so um, I think growing up, I'd always found fungi fascinating. I remember going mushroom collecting with my grandmother and sort of amazed at these. Um, but at school, you don't really get a lot of experience to my fungal microbiology in general. Sad. And I, I was a big David Attenborough fan, as we all are, and I thought I would do animal behavior at university mm -hmm. but in my very first term at university we had some microbiology lectures and particularly on fun and I just thought wow these are incredible you know they're very good for us you know and we've been talking much about you know making wonderful food mm -hmm. they produce an amazing variety of really beneficial chemicals such as antibiotics but statins used to control uh, cholesterol those came came from fungi originally right yes uh, we've got other applications such as enzymes from fungi so things like 
biological washing powders. Most of those rely on fungal enzymes. Uh, citric acid, which is used, you know, for the in the food industry for soft drinks. It's a whole range of wonderful applications. But then you've also got the fact that there's a number of bad fungi, you know, that cause plant and human disease. Yes. Uh, other animal disease. There's one, for instance, that's ravaging populations of uh, amphibians worldwide at the moment called chytridomycosis that's mm -hmm. estimated to kill up to around a third of frogs worldwide over the past 15 years. Mm -hmm. So you get both the good and the bad side of, and I just thought these are such an amazing group of organisms. Yeah. And, I, and also <laughs> at a practical level, I was fascinated that you could just take a little bit of fungus, put it on a Petri dish and that's it would cool. grow, you know, you could see this lovely little colony and some of them you get, um some quite spectacular colors then and also i must admit i like eating wild mushrooms so i go foraying for one. and you know you've got the lovely and so put it all together i thought i really want to do something yeah try to see if we can get something beneficial out of them because they are such a wonderful source as a as, as a kingdom yes yes i mean it's like they're sort of living uh you know alongside us almost you know almost hidden in plain sight aren't they <laughs> yes because people i think there's some figures like for under each meter of woodland soil there are tens of thousands yeah. if not hundreds of thousands of kilometers of fungal hyphae i don't know if you know about the humongous fungus have you heard of i've had yes it's the biggest one it's in is it is it in kind of is it kind of yellowstone park or something in america that, that's it well, it's slightly yeah. south of that yeah. uh, in oregon state but it's meant to be the world's in terms of area yeah or anything but in terms of area it's estimated to be the world's largest organism yeah about maybe up to about seven thousand years old 1600 football pitches i think it is in size is that yes i suppose all of that is underground right but it's all underground so yeah. the only time that you see it that particular group of fungi when they sexually reproduce they produce uh toadstools okay. so the only time you see it is in the autumn when they suddenly they all the toadstool up. all spring up uh which interestingly is their sexual organ <laughs> People yes, often yeah. don't appreciate that when they're eating mushrooms, that they're <laughs> species sexual organ. The um, fruity so, body. Yeah, so the yeah. fruity body on the gills has got all We should sexual. start calling our sexual organs fruiting bodies. That sort of that sounds that's quite nice. Um so uh, <laughs> uh I'll leave that with you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um I okay, one last question. I mean, I had uh, you know when I was uh when I was young, I used to go and pick uh, the field mushrooms as well. Like mm -hmm. you, I used to sell them to the Chinese restaurants in Bingham when I was a kid. Oh, very enterprising! Yes, in those days, in those days, it was it was all right to do that sort of thing. I suspect it's not now, but um, but it was you know they were quite happy for me to mm. you know kind of give them over for a few quid. Um, so my last question is: What do you what's what's what is the most exciting thing about um, fungi or fungi that you either have learned or that you you hope is possible in the future? Is there, oh, is there something? That's a good question. Um, I Well, there, there's so many good things about them. I'm almost spoiled for choice is the problem. Um, yeah. But I, I think one, just going back to something I've, I suppose I've already checked, covered a little bit, was the all protein work. Uh -huh. and, um, I think that, you know, looking forward, you know, mankind, humankind, the amount of meat we're consuming, et cetera. Mm. Um, I think we can't go on eating that much meat. You know, it's just no. in terms of environmental thing. It's non non-sustainable absolutely yes. so we do, we do need like a next generation version of this and it's almost like sci-fi but if you could imagine a new fungus thing you know that's eating waste compounds like waste straw waste product 
And corn is already a little bit like that. You know, it's only got a tenth of the carbon footprint of traditional meat. Uh -huh. uh, so we're in uh, contact with both people at the University of Nottingham and uh, Mike Aeneas. We're trying to sort of conjure up at the moment a new alt protein future for fungi where yeah. we're going to be not only using fungi, you know, so some people might be eating cultivated meats as you know, it's a complementary thing. But I yeah. think the fungal kingdom, you know, we were even talking about a mixture of uh, cultivated meat with fungi producing the texture for them. So you've yeah. got cultivated meat cells growing on a fungal scaffold. Yeah, I've heard that. Quite it could be quite fascinating. So I think, you know, it's really exciting potential for humankind, what the fungi could do. Um and I in return, think, uh, we get think, their lovely fruiting bodies. <laughs> yeah, I think the I think the palates of uh, of of um, uh, of the public would would be more open to eating, uh, you know, kind of fungi meat than it perhaps is eating cultivated meat at the moment. You know, mm. I suppose I suppose kind of fungi is, is more familiar to them than than you know than the idea of growing meat in a vat. So. It might be it might be an easier sell. It's my point. Yes, I mean it, this is just sort of thinking, you know, outside the box. Yeah. Um, and already we've got things like tempeh, which is you know is soy being broken down with the fungus. So we've already got textured fungal products out there. Yeah, it might be that we can grow it on other plant ways to get some quite novel flavors. Uh -huh. um, and one pro project we're trying to get underway is um, maybe do a, a survey of the fungal kingdom to see if we can even find the new corn, as it were. Some, and there are some companies in America, in the States, for example, have done that already with some alternatives. Mm -hmm. So there might be things hidden out there that, you know, might give us some really <laughs> exciting, yeah, low, you know, low fat, high protein and tasty food you, and also um in addition to that there's also uh enzymes produced by certain strains of fungi which are very good for kind of re uh you know to sort of re-energizing the sort of mental synapses you know that's kind of good for alzheimer's and and things yeah. like that you know so sort of lion's mane and 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 such like yes <laughs> um fascinatingly uh um, I, I imagine you might be familiar with psilocybe mushrooms or magic I'm mushrooms. Familiar? <laughs> well, I won't ask how familiar. You better not ask me that question. I'm either. not going to. No. <laughs> um, but over the past few years, there's been a number of reports that you can use psilocybin, so the active extract, uh, to treat a number of mental health conditions. And there's yes. a big research group led by an ex-government minister in London who've been promoting this very much. And it seems that the psilocybin produces longer term, more stable control than do the traditional drugs that are used to use it. So again, we've got mm. fun fungi producing a really interesting metabolite. Um, the Another interesting, um, there was a thing called ergotism. I don't yeah. know if you've uh, I know which, what the ergot is. That's the that's the bit from the LSD, isn't it? That's right. So that's that again is a fungal product, <laughs> okay. and it was one that used uh, and it still does infect cereal crops, particularly things like rye. Naturally, yeah. so going back to the Middle Ages, it's thought that um, and that it was nicknamed Saint Anthony's Fire, and it's mm. you know people were said to be mad or witches because they were hallucinating, raving. But it, it there's fairly good evidence now it was due to the presence of the ergot yeah. rye. Um, and in fact, this is leading to me to remember one, as I say, I'm very interested in sexual reproduction in fungi. And one of the other projects we've got is looking at sexual hormones that fungi produce. Uh -huh. um, and it looks like these are really key modulators for triggering fungal sex. So we may yet have the new fungal Viagra. If we... <laughs> <laughs> oh, and, uh, so uh, 
that again is watch this space. So this is on ongoing research. And then. that's going to be using sort of ergot and psilocybin, or is that not? Or is that not? That's not. Um, not no, th this would. Be, um, they are secondary comp. So they're different compounds. Those okay. ones. Uh, but when fung fungi undergo sexual reproduction. Uh, we've got evident, growing evidence now that they produce hormonal compounds that mediate the fungi coming together and then mediate the production of the fruiting bodies. Okay. And also, intriguingly, at the same point, they switch off asexual reproduction. So they right. say to the fungus, get ready for sex, you know. We're... And we've got some work together with a group at Rothamsted Research where we're looking to see if we can use those to control plant and animal diseases because it suppresses the growth okay, okay. And this is all working and that would be really exciting if that were to fascinating stuff my um my brother-in-law is a farmer and um on the farm that, that he he works on he says that they have this machine that blows off all the org all the ergot from the um um you know from the uh, wheat or rye mm. or, or wherever mm. it grows and he says that if they have you know in the past they've had years where they've had a uh you know a big problem with their guts and and they have this machine which kind of blows it all off and stores it all in a big um in a big vat so you'll get mm. a got you know and um yeah which you know if you need if you need access to, to a, big, <laughs> a huge amount of ergot, I might be able to get it for you. But uh, which is a, a controlled substance. But yeah, we'll we'll, we'll talk about that afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, Paul, that's really really very interesting. Um, and um, I hope to perhaps sort of catch up with you at some point in the future. Mm. But thank you for coming on to Future of Food and uh, and telling me all that great stuff. Yeah, well, thank you for the invitation. It's been fascinating. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Oh, thank you.